I was at the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, right? And I saw all these pedicabs. I'd never seen these pedicabs before being driven by these like scrawny vegan white dudes. And I'm like, I've never seen that. They call them pedicabs, but they're basically bicycle rickshaws. And I got in the back of one, and this dude's like, where do you want to go? And I'm like, I don't give a shit. You take me as far as you can take me. My grandmother in India would not believe this. My grandson's made it, he's made it! <laughs> This is some weird kind of colonial justice. <laughs> when I feel pain, but I can turn that pain into laughter, it, it's, wow. It's incredible how we recycle pain. And we turn it into something so positive. Please welcome the very funny Hari Kondabolu. Hari Kondabolu. Hari Kondabolu! At Hari Kondabolu's show tonight in Brooklyn, it's standing room only. Hari is one of a series of artists we're looking at who've discovered that playing into racial stereotypes is out. You've got to confront everything. I think I saw his first show on Letterman and I was just like blown away. I was like, wow, this guy is kind of touching on all the topics that like I myself have grown up with. I'm from Bangladesh. Personally, I um, mirror a lot of his experiences, but I'm sure it, it applies to a lot of people of different races. Hari's new album, called Waiting for 2042, gets its title straight from census figures, which show that America's demographics are shifting. 2042, for those of you who don't know, is the year when white people will be the minority in this country. And <laughs> waiting for it. With help from his over 38,000 Twitter followers, the album has been a huge success on iTunes. My comedy always reflected who I am at that moment. So early on, it certainly wasn't particularly political, but I was very race conscious. And it's hard not to be um, one growing up in New York, growing up in Queens, the most diverse place in the world. And watching media, whether it's TV or film, like any young person does, and realizing, oh, we don't exist here. If something makes me angry, that's a sign that it could be a joke. Because it means that I find something that doesn't make sense in it. Often it's, I'm angry because it's not just or fair. Um, so that's a good starting point, but I need a joke. I grew up in, uh, in Queens, New York, uh, which is the most diverse place in the world. I went to college in Maine, which, this is less so. I remember uh, admissions told me there'd be a surge of diversity when I got to campus. And, uh, the trick was, I was the surge they were telling me. People go to comedy clubs a lot of times to escape. It's like, oh, everything's so bad, let me just laugh. But not all comedians start to do comedy for escape. They start to do comedy to clarify, you know. And Hari is one of the comedians. Is like he's doing comedy to explain the world around him. Hari and W. Kamau Bell have both been regulars on the stand-up comedy circuit for years. Hari was also a correspondent on Kamau's short-lived show, Totally Biased. If it isn't obvious yet, I love the spelling bee, or as I like to call it, the Indian Super Bowl. <laughs> Six winners in a row! Six in a row, son! That's incredible! So it gives me great pleasure to finally say, hey, white people, learn the language. There always seems to have to be somebody who creates a new paradigm. We used to have the rooms where white comics performed, and there was the Chitlin circuit. There wasn't a lot of crossover. And at some point, Dick Gregory was like, you know what, I'm going to play the white clubs. <laughs> but I'm going to talk to them the way I talk to the people in the black clubs. And the whole generation of comments went, oh, oh, we can do it like that? Hari said Richard Pryor's 1976 album in particular shows that comedy doesn't always have to be about the laughs. They brought me over here in a boat. <laughs> There's 400 of us come over here. <laughs> 360 of us died on the way over here. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's so painful. It's, it's so hard to hear. And you hear people laughing uncomfortably, but it isn't about that. You know, you can just affect people on a deep level emotionally, and that's good too. I was hanging out with a friend in Portland, Maine. We're going to a Thai restaurant. It's pouring rain out, and we're walking to this restaurant, and all of a sudden I see this white dude walking towards me with a shirt off. And as he got closer to me, I realized he had a swastika tattooed on his chest. 
right? Now there's a part of me that believes in free speech that thought to myself, yeah, man. <laughs> Don't let the rain prevent you from expressing your political beliefs. But then the minority part of me was like, run, you need to run now. <laughs> Do not die in a cliched manner. Like it's, it's lonely to deal with racism and ha not have someone to say, I saw that and it's awful. I felt that for you too. And it's lonely being a stand-up comic. You know, you're on stage by yourself um, talking about personal experiences and you're trying to make people laugh. And if they don't laugh, you feel even worse. You brought it up. You're the one who brought it up. This man had a swastika tattooed on his chest which just goes to show you how dysfunctional the white supremacist movement is. Really white supremacist. You couldn't get an umbrella with a swastika on it. It's cathartic to make people laugh for me because it means I'm not alone. That other people find this absurd as well. Etsy could not provide you with such an option.